Hello, today we will be talking about the mental status exam. As in other fields of medicine, the psychiatrist does an objective examination of the patient. This helps with differential diagnosis, alerts to progression of treatment, and helps with safety assessment. To organize this objective data, we use the format of the mental status exam. Doing a proper mental status exam requires practice and astute observation skills. The components of the mental status exam are appearance, behavior and activity, speech, mood, affect, thought process, thought content, attention and concentration, orientation, memory, judgment and insight. The first section is appearance. In this section you answer the question, what do they look like? Comment on posture, body habitus, whether they appear their stated age, grooming and hygiene. Make sure to comment on anything unusual, strange appearing clothing, tattoos, or dyed hair. Look for objective findings that could let you know whether they are taking care of themselves or not. Bad odor and a scraggly beard versus freshly painted fingernails, a pressed and a pressed button up shirt. The next section is behavior and activity. In this section, you comment on the patient's attitude towards the interviewer and answer the question, what are they doing? When commenting on attitude, you can state whether they are open and engaged, guarded, hostile and defiant, or pleasant and polite. You then comment on what they are doing. Do they make direct eye contact or is their gaze downcast? Are they sitting calmly or agitated and fidgeting throughout the interview? When they move, does it appear slowed down? Do they suddenly bolt up from their seat? Is their gait normal or unsteady? You can also comment on findings from a tone exam, including any muscle rigidity or dystonia. Make sure to comment on any unusual behavior. Following behavior and activity, you comment on speech. In this section, you comment on their quality and quantity of speech. Do they use mostly one word answers or is there a steady stream of speech? Are they interruptible? Are they talk talking fast or slowly? Do they have pressured speech? Or is there latency to their responses? The next section is mood. In this section, you record what the patient says when you ask, how is your mood? If the patient gives a vague answer like, fine, you can always ask more questions to get to a mood word. After mood, you comment on affect. In this section, you answer the question, how does the patient look like they are feeling? Here you describe their observable emotional state. First describe their overall emotional tone. Do they appear euphoric or elated? Do they appear dysphoric, sad and depressed? Is their mood normal or euthymic? Or do they appear anxious? Once this overall tone is established, comment on the range and stability. Do they have limited emotional expression? If so, they could have a restricted or blunted affect. Does their affect quickly change from ecstatic one second to tearful the next? If so, their affect would be described as labile. Is there no affective expression? Then they have a flat affect. The next section is thought process. Thought process describes the connection between thoughts. Is their thought process organized or not? From most organized to least, we describe thought process as linear, circumstantial, tangential, loose associations, flight of ideas, and finally, word salad. A linear thought process is when the patient goes from point A to point B in a direct and logical manner. You can easily follow their train of thought. A patient is circumstantial when they start at point A and add many irrelevant details. They eventually get to point B, but it takes a while, is long-winded, and shares material that is not relevant to the purpose of the exposition. They may seem like they are getting off topic, but then bring it back. This can be a sign of pathology, but is often seen in non-pathological patients too. A tangential thought process is when the patient frequently gets off topic and never brings it back. They start at point A and never make it to point B. The interviewer often feels lost and that they are not getting the story. Loose associations is when the patient makes tangential jumps to topics that are only marginally related. The patient starts at point A and then jumps to point U and then point D and then point X and Z and never makes it to point B. Flight of ideas is when the patient jumps from one topic to another in a constant stream of speech. Each topic is not related to the other. And finally, word salad is when the patient speaks in such a way that there is no connection from word to word. Everything is jumbled and you cannot follow their train of thought at all. Besides the above, you can also comment on other phenomenon like thought blocking, where a patient's speech is suddenly interrupted by silence, clanging, where words are chosen based on their sounds or rhythm rather than meaning, and concreteness of thought. After thought process, you describe thought content. Here you comment on whether the patient is suicidal or homicidal and whether they have psychotic symptoms. This is often a mixture of what the patient says, which is a subjective data, and what you observe. Here you answer questions like, does the patient endorse passive or active suicidal thoughts? Does the patient express intent to commit suicide? Does the patient endorse seeing or hearing things that others don't? More importantly, comment on behaviors, if any, that you observe that seem to indicate that the patient is psychotic, having hallucinations or delusional. 
Does the patient have any delusions? If so, what does the patient say that sounds delusional? Under thought content, you can also comment on preoccupations, obsessions, or ruminations, and whether they have a lack of or poverty of content. The next section is attention and concentration. Here you comment on whether the patient is alert, awake, and attentive. Is the patient falling asleep during the interview? Does he appear distracted by noises in the room or other stimuli? The next section is orientation. Does the patient know where she is, what date it is, and what is going on? After orientation, you comment on memory. Under memory, you answer the question, can the patient remember? Evaluate whether the patient can answer questions about their past. You can comment on both long-term and short-term memory, memory related to their own experiences, and general knowledge. Some ways you evaluate their memory is by remarking on if they can recall detailed information, like the names of their medications and dosages. You can also ask if they can recall personal information. In addition, you can do a more formal test, like a three-word recall, or even a longer test like the MOCA or the MMSE. The final section is judgment and insight. Judgment answers the question, are they able to make reasonable decisions? Insight has to do with whether they understand their situation. Do they know they are sick or do they feel they have no reason to see a psychiatrist? Putting it all together, you have a snapshot of the patient's mental status. This can be very helpful for developing a differential diagnosis. A patient who tells you that he owns a country but is poorly groomed, malodorous, has a long beard and a tangential thought process, most likely has a psychotic disorder. A well-documented mental status exam can be helpful to evaluate a patient's progression, to clue other physicians or other clinicians into what the patient's baseline is, and to evaluate where they are at right now. Finally, the mental status exam can help with assessment and can guide you in your treatment planning.